Now uh, we'll move on to a very interesting uh, person and keynote speaker. Sheikh Al Bahar is currently the deputy group CEO at the National Bank of Kuwait, Kuwait's first and largest national bank. Sheikh Al Bahar was the CEO of the of MBK, where she was in charge of the bank's operation. And prior to C-suite level posts, uh, Al Bahar headed the corporate banking group at NBK. Uh, she is also a member of the board of directors at the International Bank of Qatar. Forbes ranked her as the 85th most powerful woman in the world in 2012. And Arab Business ranked, her, ranked Al Bahar as the eighth most powerful Arab woman of 2012. You are the first one for me. <laughs> Sheikh Al Bahar also serves as director of mobile telecommunications company uh, KSC and vice chairperson of Watani Investment Company. Please join me in welcoming Sheikh Al Bahar on stage. Uh, thank you so much, distinguished guests, fellow speakers, and London Business School students. It is indeed an honor and privileged to be invited by prestigious institution like uh, London Business School to be before you today. Well, hopefully during the coming 20 minutes, I hope to share with you some insights based on my career and experience with National Bank of Kuwait. I shall cover as well bits about MENA region, Kuwait and my own experience and how, I, and how I believe that women can make and already making the move into the executive office. Let me add that my experience in a leading financial institution in the Middle East, though uncommon today, is by no means unique and can perhaps illustrate and reflect the broader positive change, changes that I believe are, are, are occurring throughout the region, especially in the way of perception and empowerment of women. First, let me begin by saying that over the last few decades, great strides have been made in the Arab world in the way of female education, health, and economic infrastructure, sorry, Enfranchisement. According to the UNDP, since 1970, the Middle East and North Africa region recorded the world's uh, fastest, fastest growth progress in human development, such that the growth rates of key indicators, such as female literacy, infant mortality, and life expectancy, uh, on average exceeded those of most other developing regions. But mind you that mostly MENA came from very low base. Significant advances have been made in reducing gender inequality at the family, community, and national level. Importantly, perceptions of the role of women in society have changed. Of, uh, for the better, such that women are no longer expected to adhere to or be constrained by traditional roles such as homemakers. To be sure, things are still relative and Arab society is still very much, you know, uh, uh, emotional. In some countries, much more than the others, but that has not placed limits, certainly not in Kuwait, my country, on what women can aspire to or achieve when they set their mind to it. And the message is very clear, I hope, for you young girls, that whenever you do put in your mind that you're gonna achieve something, you're gonna achieve it. So it's at the end of the day, it's you and not just the society. My own experience in the corporate world owes to uh, very much an enabling uh, environment in my country. Of course, condition for women can vary dramatically across the Middle East. However, in Kuwait has managed to foster over the years rich tradition 
as a progressive and pioneering country where female education and gender equality are concerned. Indeed, women have a long history of political and social activism in the country. From the first day, I mean, women have been empowered six, since the 60s, the 50s, and 30s. I mean, a lot of Kuwaiti women, they went outside Kuwait to receive their education. So Kuwait, unlike Arab countries, I mean, uh, uh, women, they have their full rights, except maybe the voting power, which, hopefully, which uh, thankfully has been taken in 2005. And by then, after four years, four uh, ladies uh, were, you know, parliament members. Kuwait, Kuwait was the highest-ranked Arab country in gender equality. In 2000, 2011, according to the UNDP Gender Inequality Index, Kuwait ranked as the fourth in the Arab countries and 47th worldwide. When you look at women's involvement in labor force, women's share has more than doubled from 20 to 43 in 2013. And Kuwait has the third highest female labor force. It's in the private sector, it's almost 50-50, but in the public sector, it's around 55, uh, I mean, domina dominant by, uh, by males. Uh, for your information, I mean, Kuwait is very keen to invest more and more in education. So education and quality is education is an issue. Uh, with the quality education, we can groom uh, women and give them the opportunity to excel. And I'm really very proud to say that I really uh, uh, gained, this, gained this opportunity and I worked in the private sector to be, uh, at the end of the day, I mean, uh, one of the leaders within our institution, which is National Bank of Kuwait. So the secret is mainly in the private sector. And again, the message to you, young girls, as well as boys, go towards, towards the private sector. I mean, we have love stars even in this room from the private sector. I can say with proud and happiness that Wafa Al Gatami, who's currently sitting next to me, was sitting next to me. She's the first lady as, you know, board member in the Chamber of Commerce. And we have a lot of examples in Kuwait. We have MPs, we have ministers. So, I mean, the challenge when the society accepts, uh, uh, I mean, women, so the challenge is you. You have to take it by yourself. I mean, you have always to say that I can do it, I can achieve it, then it's you. So uh, uh, Kuwait it, it differ, differs from other GCC countries. And it's worth mentioning that Arabian business in their last, latest edition have included nine women from Kuwait as part of the 100 most powerful women in the Arab world. This progress, I mean, uh, uh, underpinned by significant development in education since the country's independence in 1960. And I have a great story for you. In, in the university, and most of the graduates are females and not males, it's 64 to uh, 36 to, uh, to males. And accordingly, the uh, university decided to encourage uh, ma males to give them a higher quota and ratio in acceptance in the university. So basically, I mean, women, they like the challenge, they take the challenge, and they excel. Even in the higher education, I mean, Kuwait opens the uh, uh, way and the venue for higher education outside Kuwait. And fortunately, mostly it's uh, females. I mean, again, it's 65% uh, as female uh, taking or pursuing their education 
outside uh, Kuwait. So, I mean, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's at the end of the day, it's you ladies, if you want to excel, if you want to lead, then you have to work with passion, to work uh, very hard, and to go to the private sector rather the, than the public sector. From my experience, I was really lucky to work with the merchant families in Kuwait. I mean, I was lucky to work with some of the founders of National Bank of Kuwait. And, you know, the, all of them are really entrepreneurs. They built, built their wealth uh, and uh, uh, they decided to, I mean, establish MBK out of challenge. And now MBK is uh, one of the most successful banks. It's one of the most largest banks, total assets around $72 billion and profit more or less around $1 billion. So uh, the private sector, the sector opens you know, uh, the sky for you. And uh, the issue of even inequality of uh, the contribution of the private sector, the GDP, here I'm talking about GCC and Kuwait, the contribution of uh, the private sector is a little, a little bit in the low side if we compare it to the public sector. So uh, we need to, let's say, bridge the gap between the private sector and the public sector. But as I said, I mean, public sector always ready to take the challenge and to give the opportunity to both genders, I mean, men and women. Uh, so with more private sector, the opportunities will be higher and higher for females and uh, all what it needs that you give uh, uh, more time and you work 24-7, uh, you work with passion, with empathy, uh, empathy and uh, uh, consistency and of course with good communication with your colleagues and to emphasize more and more on the teamwork. So basically, uh, the challenge for you as females is, as I said, education and quality education. So make sure that you are gaining from your presence here in London Business School, uh, uh, taking the opportunity to uh, take your career to a different level, level by joining the uh, uh, private sector, because unfortunately in Kuwait and even in other GCC, I mean, there is kind of competition between the public sector and private sector. We are, we are seeing some of the young uh, bankers are moving from I mean, the private sector joining the public sector due to the higher pay, unfortunately, and definitely less pressure. So believe me, pressure is great and good. You learn from pressure. Pressure means a new opportunity for you. Pressure means that you are challenging yourself and stretching, overstretching your uh, technical capabilities as well as the soft wear of or the soft side of your uh, career, which is communication, leadership, and uh, 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 too many other uh, issues. So, um, I mean, my advice to you, uh, as I mentioned, focus on your education, accept the challenge, and I'm sure that when you raise the bar, you will achieve it as long as the society will open up for you and will give you the opportunity. Because in other countries, unfortunately, I mean, female are, females, females are threatened. And in some cases, they are even uh, shut uh, down for going to school. But uh, a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, you are taking the opportunity and having the opportunity to learn and you have to benefit from this uh, great uh, opportunity. I don't want to take much of your time because I know you, especially the females, you have too many questions for me to, to ask, so I will leave the floor for more questions rather than, I mean, I keep uh, talking. Thank you very much. Um, as a woman, a Lebanese woman who's worked in... Can you speak up, please? Sorry, I'm, I'm a Lebanese woman and I've worked in Paris, in London and Beirut. 
And I wish maybe Lebanon was like Kuwait. When I went to my family business, the conversation went, if you were a man, I would give you the business. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I can't change that. So I came to London Business School to study some more. But would you be able to point us to things that we women can do in the Middle East to make our future better? Because at this, mo at this point, it doesn't look so great. Uh, well, basically, our future will be better, as I mentioned, with better education. Uh, the emphasis has to be, uh, I mean, uh, uh, on uh, education. And I'm sure corporates as well, as well as countries, if they want to build their nations and if they want to have, I mean, com competent uh, 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 employees and nationals, they have to invest more and more in quality education. So, and the most importantly, to open up for the private sector rather than having, you know, most of the activities done by uh, the public sector. So, uh, a combination of education and privatization or public sector, we will have better future for uh, the Arab world. So, let's start with education, education, education. Um, business women who um, are on glassy, glossy magazines, rocking the buggy with one hand and the triplet, um, with the triplets and running the corporation and being a CEO of a big company with the other, um, tend to give a different opinion when you talk to them privately. Um, I talked to a banker before and she said it would be safer to come out as a cocaine addict in her firm than as a mother. So... <laughs> Where is the question? You know, <laughs> so when you said that, um, I the, a woman should s tell herself, I can do it, I can achieve it. Is that to mothers as well? And um, do you think that the hand that uh, rocks the cradle can rock the boardroom or not? Thanks. Well, when you say I can achieve it, I can do it. As I said, you always raise the bar. You have to accept the challenge. I mean, there is no difference in, I mean, between the two genders. Men, men and women are facing the same challenge. So basically, it's the same. T I mean, you are working in the same teamwork. You are part of the first work. I mean, as you know, women represent 50% of most societies. So you have to be, uh, I mean, uh, uh, very, uh, you have to be, very uh, demanding, you have to question everything, you have to learn from your mistakes. I mean, don't get depress depressed when you face any, any challenge or you, ha you, ha you make uh, mistakes, no. Mistake means that you, you, you did not learn. You have to learn from this mistake and take it as your challenge and then uh, uh, do the, the needed, you know, learn more, uh, try to, inv to uh, uh, I mean, ask, and to uh, uh, read more about this issue, then you learn it by experience. I mean, don't worry if you do mistakes. I mean, uh, mistake is, is a way to, to learn more. Um, sorry, can I ask another question? Yeah. So, <laughs> sorry. Um, so it's known that about two thirds of the world, like women have jobs, like two thirds of the jobs. And they only take one third of like the money they get paid. Only one third. Is that is that fair? Do you think? And also for the mother thing, um, are you saying that uh, a mother should talk to her or say goodnight stories to her child over Skype while doing some work or reaching for whatever she wants to do? I, I didn't get your question. You keep giving me statements rather than questions. I'm just saying, do you think that uh, a mother or a woman should reach for whatever she wants, a goal, a job, or something, even if that she has a child? So should she like, be, for example, in China and her child is here and tell her, tell her child like, goodnight stories while working and reaching her goal? Or should she take care of her child and, and give up her goal or whatever? Well, at the end of the day, you have to uh, strike a balance between, you, between your personal life and your career. If you are a career woman, then you have to sacrifice, I mean, at the end of the day. And uh, maybe in GCC, where are you from? I mean, we are lucky that even, I mean, uh, uh, 
having someone like uh, to take care of the kids, then you can pursue your your uh, uh, career, and you know you can play two roles. Uh, I want to say that that uh, I'm not married, but I'm a single mother. I raised four kids, and I'm very proud and happy with my kids. And two of them just received their master's degree from Aston University. So, I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's you. If you want to accept, as I said, the, the challenge, you have to spend and put more time. I work 24 hours. I believe in, tw in, in working 24 hours. It's part of our, the culture of MBK, the culture that we inherited from our founders, you know, uh, uh, the hard work, the 24 seven, 7, the passion. So you have to work very hard if you want to be a leader, if you want to achieve something different, if you want to differentiate yourself. But don't tell me that you want to sit at home you know, and then you want to be a leader. Then you want to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, a mother, a good mother. And we need good mothers, but we definitely will be very proud having, you know, uh, good mothers and leaders. I just want to say thank you. You are an excellent example for um, a younger generation of women. But at the same time, I have to kind of challenge some of the points you've made. Now, our generation of women have been taught that we can have it all. Now, I know I've been working for many years, and that's not true. You were saying to us that we have to choose to be a mother or somebody who works in business. That's fine, but the reality is, is that you're saying if we educate ourselves, we will succeed. That is not true. The laws in the country have to change as well. I mean, here in Britain, where I grew up, even though I'm Arabic myself, they have made a policy of putting women 10% or something in the board. That is, has to be done in countries around the Middle East as well. We have to comply with these. And we look to you as in our example, as somebody who to lead that sometimes. And that girl, she's just expressing what she's feeling about the frustration sometimes of being a woman. And at people like, I don't know, Lean In, uh, Cheryl Sandberg, talks the truth. The laws that have to change. Um, I don't believe that we do have to choose between being a mother or a business person. I don't think that's correct. The world is changing. And I do applaud what you're doing. But the choices you made must have been very difficult for your generation of women. You're not the only one I've seen make these choices. And I feel like we don't have to choose. I don't think that's correct. We can, we can be good mothers and of we can work. Yeah, yeah, of course. I, I, I fully agree. I mean, as I mentioned, uh, we have a lot of successful uh, I mean, mothers and they are leaders. And uh, as I said, working 24-7 will give you the opportunity to excel in both roles as a mother as well as a leader. Uh, so, I mean, it depends. If you want to take it easy and soft, then you cannot be a leader, but you're gonna be a great mother. And I fully agree that we have to change a lot of flows. I mean, we are very lucky in Kuwait that it's, uh, there is no kind of discrimination between men and women. We have equality in wages, uh, equality in, in, in positions, equality in uh, uh, promotions, equality, uh, equality in uh, uh, education. So maybe I agree in other countries, they have to work on certain laws to give the opportunity for women or females to excel in their, in their career. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, I believe, again, it's you, how you accept the challenge and how you have to work very hard to build your own career. It's not just the community or, or the law or the society. At the end of the day, it's you. Hi, uh, thank you very much for taking my question. Um, I'm really impressed with you, and I just recalled my time when I was in Abu Dhabi working for one of the sovereign wealth funds, and I was the only woman manager across 700 employees. I could reach up there because I was educated. I'm alumni of uh, London Business School, proudly enough. And I could reach there, but then the struggle after that was really impossible. Uh, and same, again, it recently happened that um, I got a call from Qatar uh, where they wanted me to join their bank at a very high position, but then the first question they raised was, are you married? Are you single? Well, we don't know if we could arrange the visa for you because you're a woman, and it depends as to whether you're married or not. <laughs> so. I really have a question to you as to, okay, I could, it seems like I could reach up to that stage, even though international person, I'm not a GCC background person, I could reach up to that stage, but then once I get in there, then it's again a fight against males versus females. Could you please give advice on those? Thank you. 
Exactly, exactly. As Wafa uh, said, it's at the end of the day regulations. I fully agree. Sorry, it's not a question. I, I work for the Arab British Chamber of Commerce, but I just would like to comment um, in your comment twice. Once with uh, His Royal Highness Turkel Faisal and again now. Uh, I don't think this is true. Uh, we totally disagree with this because your experience in Saudi, uh, there is a huge number of businesses from the UK all over the world going to Saudi and they succeed. At the, again with Qatar, I don't agree with that. We know we do visas for these two countries and we know how easy to go and succeed in Saudi, the GCC, and the GCC ladies are succeeding all over the world. Our CEO, uh, as an organization representing the Arab world in the UK, is a female from Saudi. So I, I just thought to clear this. Thank you. Thanks for the comment. Um, good afternoon. Nigel Hatton Payton from Bonus McFarlane Educational Consultants. I've been working in the Middle East with families for about 15 years now, uh, and I'm getting more and more requests from the families uh, to help with the girls, and how can we prepare them for the workplace. I think, and this doesn't just apply to girls in the Middle East, but everywhere, is that I'm talking to employees on a daily basis, and whilst a degree is important, they're all saying what we really want to see are kids who've got off their backsides and gone and had experiences, have done stuff. Their only marketing tool at a young age is their curriculum vitae. And they want to get as much on that CV so that they make themselves uh, more attractive to a prospective employee by just getting experiences. That could be anything from humanitarian work, working with charities. It's just get out there, go and travel if you're able to. Uh, this will all help build your profile. There are some other things which I think particularly with the families that I deal with that I encourage them to do. And that is <clears throat> helping with voice coaching, improving their debating skills, and there's one fantastic course, which Lambda, which is the London Academy of Music, Music Drama and Art, and they do a three-week short course where um, they cover everything, uh, including karate and fight acting. But it's in incredibly empowering, that course, and I haven't met any girl that's come off it that hasn't seen the benefit of it. So that was just... I thought, hopefully, might be a few useful tips. It might be a tricky question. Uh, as we know, Kuwait was a leader in the 50s, 60s, banks, uh, sovereign wealth funds, and so on. But unfortunately, for the last 30 years, compared to other GCC, they have not progressed a lot. And it's a shame. Do you think, why? <laughs> Do you want to, ask this, to answer this question of uh, being the <laughs> member of the Chamber of Commerce? Well, I think uh, we had, uh, for a period of time, some disputes between our government and the parliament, and this have delayed a lot of uh, um, infrastructure and uh, plans. We have, you know, this uh, government plan, which is about 40 million KD, that's about $120 billion. And it was supposed to be carried on, but because of so many uh, problems and uh, we have so many elections, so many changes of the cabinet in Kuwait, have delayed all these projects for a while, but we're looking forward and uh, these things will be changed to a better situation. Uh, but it's all in the Arab countries we have faced these problems, unfortunately. So, but let me just uh, answer this question from my side. Uh, projects kick-started in Kuwait already, and we've been see, seeing too many uh, mega projects uh, in Kuwait. For instance, the clean fuel, it's the largest uh, project ever in Kuwait. It's around 3.6 billion dinars, and MBK is leading this uh, project. Uh, and uh, lately, I mean, uh, the, uh, they uh, awarded the power uh, plant uh, project. It's the first PPP project. It's around $3 billion. Again, MBK is the only Arab bank uh, participating 
uh, to this uh, project. And we are seeing too many projects in the healthcare as well as, you know, roads and so on. So we are a bit late, but I mean, we are doing extremely well in terms of, uh, uh, I mean, development uh, plan. And hopefully we will see more and more of uh, projects which will help the economy, of course, because as you know, most of the big and mega projects, they have small projects around them, and these projects are handled by local contractors, which, which will boost and give, you know, uh, a big increase to the uh, local economy. 